Hi, I'm Stephen, and today me and Jennifer are going to talk about the bystander effect. So, what is bystander effect? If you witness an emergency happening right before your eyes, you will certainly take some sort of action to help the person in trouble, right? Well, the bystander effect suggests that it may not be true. Whether you would take action or not will depend on the number of people around you. The bystander effect, or bystander apathy, is a social psychological phenomenon in which individuals are less likely to offer help to a victim when other people are present. This phenomenon first attracted people's attention through the infamous 1964 Kitty Genovese murder in New York City. In 1964, thirty-eight New Yorkers watched through their windows as one of their neighbors was brutally murdered. Her name was Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old woman. On March 13th, she came back from work late at night, as usual, only to be stabbed by a random man named Winston Mosley four times in the back. The screams were loud and unmistakable. One neighbor opened the window and yelled, "What's going on down there?" Immediately after getting attention of the criminal, Mosley fled the scene and left Kitty crawling towards her apartment. After about ten minutes, Mosley returned and stabbed Kitty another eight times. Then he stole the money of the victim, sexually assaulted her, and ran away. A neighbor finally phoned the police, but by the time the ambulance arrived, it was too late to save her. This case shocked the city, not because a person got murdered. But a person got murdered. Her neighbors watched, yet nobody did anything. Two psychologists, John Darley and Bit Blatin, got inspired by this topic and conducted several experiments in the study of bystander apathy effect. One of the experiments that they have done is the smoke-filled room experiment. They had subjects begin to fill up questionnaires in a room to which they began to add smoke. In the first condition, the subject was alone. In the second condition, three naive subjects were in the room. In third condition, they have one naive subject and two confederates who purposely noticed and then ignored the smoke. So, how many subjects reported the smoke? The result of the experiment was: seventy-five percent of the alone subjects left the room to report the smoke in an average time of two minutes. Thirty-eight percent in the second condition reported, and only ten percent in the last condition took action. Others would rather keep working on the questionnaire, rub their eyes, and wave the smoke out of their faces. In fact, most subjects had similar initial reactions. Those who didn't report it all later explained that they thought the smoke wasn't dangerous or was part of the experiment. No one attributed their inactivity to the presence of others in the room. So why do most people naturally become bystanders? Apparently, individuals are less likely to get themselves involved in an emergency when other people are present. On the other hand, the less number of people around, the better chance individuals are to react. There are said to be two reasons for the bystander effect. One, diffusion of responsibility. It means that onlookers think someone else will intervene and therefore feel less responsible. Two, pluralistic ignorance. Individuals in a group tend to monitor the behavior of others around, and based on that, do they determine how to act. Pluralistic ignorance refers to the mentality that since everyone else is not reacting, my personal help is not needed. Seeing the inaction of others can lead to the thought that the emergency is not so serious. As the bystander effect stops people from taking action to help those who are in need, it definitely has a negative influence to the society. So, what can you do to avoid falling into this trap of inaction? When faced with a situation that requires action, understanding how the bystander effect might be holding you back and consciously taking steps to overcome it can help. And what should you do if you're the one that needs help? One often recommended tactic is to single out one person from the crowd. If you ask one particular individual for help, it will be a lot harder for him or her to refuse your offer. 
Is it proper to duplicate this experiment today? According to the American Psychological Association, there are four basic ethical guidelines for research with human participants, which are informed consent, the right to be protected from harm and discomfort, the right to confidentiality, and the right to debriefing. In this experiment, the subjects do participate by volunteering, but only thinking that they are to do a questionnaire instead of knowing the actual purpose. Their safety is insecure since the smoke is innocuous, and their personal data is not revealed in any reports. So number two check, and number three check. And number four is nothing difficult to do. The participants will get a full explanation of the research after their involvement, so check. Overall, this 1968 experiment can still be done under nowadays ethical guidelines. There are criticisms saying that the 24 subjects used in this experiment make a fairly small sample size, and the complete inaction of the confederations in the second condition is unrealistic. Also, to me personally, the smoke-filled room experiment is not the best to demonstrate bystander effect since it kind of sets up a scenario similar to the bandwagon effect, which is people do something primarily because others are doing it, regardless of their own beliefs. However, there are lots of other bystander experiments done in different ways by different people. Putting test subjects in predicaments such as hearing a Caesar suffering patient, seeing a man lying in the middle of the road, and so on. And they all lead to the same conclusion. And that's all for our presentation. Here's our citations. Thanks for watching, and see ya.